70 slides, 20 minutes, so adjust your pacemakers if you need to. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, and this is actually me editing. So I like a good story, so I will have to watch myself, and I'm watching time now. Um, but there's so much that we put into our work that the audience doesn't see. So this is a great chance for us to share that with you. Uh, born in Oakland, California, and uh, of one parent from Querétaro, Mexico, and another one from Lower Rio Grande Valley, Texas, San Benito. Every year since I was born, we would take a family pilgrimage, stuffing the station wagon, all the way from uh, Oakland, following this route till we got to McAllen is the town right before San, San Benito. So, Every December we would do this, and I just thought everyone did this. I thought everybody at, Hall, at Christmas break would go to the ancestry country that they're from. I thought the Japanese kids were going to Japan. I thought the Irish kids were going to Ireland, because we went to Mexico every year, like clockwork. And it wasn't until later that I realized what an amazing experience that was for me. One week in Mexico, I mean, sorry, one week in San Benito, one week in Mexico, back to San Benito, Texas, and then back home. My father drove straight through, probably 36 hours, could never stop for anything, but the border was always to my right going there and always to my left coming back. So I really have this affinity with it. When I finally went to grad school, I realized that um, you know, they tell you to work personally. And I didn't r really expect that this work would be my life's artwork um, in, in terms of themes of border and the Latin American, uh, Latino experience, Mexican experience. And um, so this all really started in, in grad school with a series called, uh, I call it the Verbal Sarape Series. And the idea is that the Sarape would finally get a chance to speak back because of everything that's been imposed upon it stereotypically for uh, ages. So I started with a group of that and it mixes uh, my love of tech and computers with my love of hand weaving. I really want to push the idea of textiles in terms of a language, in terms of a craft, in terms of a endeavor. And I always felt like it wasn't speaking my language until I sort of put all of these elements together myself. History, uh, hyperbole, uh, weaving, and computers. So these pieces are woven in Montreal. It's the only place to get a hand-woven jacquard loom for hire. You can go up there as an artist and rent their loom for the day. And so I prepare files, I prepare ideas here, and uh, then I go up there. So at first, the, it was pretty cheerful. In terms of color, I was referencing the border souvenirs that you would get. Um, but I was also talking about things that haven't been talked about or weren't being talked about. Like Mexican reparations are really, we are not, haven't been very good about that. But uh, there's like the breaking of the Hidalgo Treaty. There's lots and lots of, of history there. But as the as, as it's gone on, and as I think maybe grad school and life embittered me, it's gotten darker <laughs> and a lot more suspicious. This one's about suspicion. This one's about um, opportunity. This one. I don't know if you've ever watched old Mexican movies, but there's always that woman in the background. She never speaks, and she's the sheriff's girlfriend, or she's the American's girlfriend, and she has that look, and she knows what's going on, and you could tell from that look, but she never speaks. So this is kind of an homage to that idea that we know. I've known your kind. I've known this situation before. It's all about suspicion. Um, these are out of order. Uh, assimilation, and I was thinking about the idea of 
this is an ongoing process for all of us, but also especially in textiles. We have paisleys now woven in uh, Peru. We have um, plaids woven in China. We have American quilts being put together in, American style quilts being put together in Indonesia. We have a big language of textiles now. It's not this really pure language. So for me, it was this idea that textiles it's, as well has been a symbol of assimilation. So that is a And Yayagamos is, is the idea of, um, they keep saying, the, you know, the Mexican people, the Latinos, they've arrived as a voting bloc, they've arrived as this, they've arrived at that. And my feeling is more or less hearing my ancestors just kind of saying, well, we've already arrived, we've always been here, so I really what is, Yayagamos is what that means. It also can mean, as kids, that's what you say for, are we there yet? So I like to pose these things that are either questions or comments and let the viewer decide for themselves. This is, okay, I'm gonna try space bar. Nope, I'm gonna try clicking. Nope. Clicking on the there. image. What's that? Is it video? Yes. On the video. There you go. Okay, this is the loom in Montreal in action. I really like your card weaving because you don't have to make the work. You're usually working with a work that's there and after making hundreds and hundreds of work, it's so nice to just think about the weft for a change. And where are you in Montreal? You're in a private studio? Uh, CMMMT. Centre Center for Contemporary Textiles, but there's also a French name for it. Which is what the letters stand for. Yes, I'm from, We're from Montreal. Oh, okay, I think it's MCCT, Montreal Center Contemporary Textiles. Sorry, it's either one of those. Okay. Uh, small school, uh, Canada is really fantastic at supporting diverse uh, organizations in, in terms of what they have to offer, not their profitability, but in terms of what they offer. And the school's fantastic, and it's the only place in North America that artists like myself actually have uh, access to that equipment. It, there are pieces like this, but they're either in for profit or they're locked up in institutions that don't let artists uh, visit. So, Beyond the Wall, this was an article that started my fascination with this idea of the wall, the barrier, trying to stop people from migrating, trying to stop humanity from bettering itself. People have been trying to do this forever and futilely. The, the Wall of China used to be a boundary for that country, it's now within that. The uh, Hayden's Wall in the UK. We have these walls where we're trying to harness people's will. So that has really been sticking with me. This idea of uh, the way the wall is built. I'm fascinated with uh, documentary photos of people climbing the walls. And I just started to want to morph this and work with it, abstract it so that it became not about any one particular race or culture, but just about that idea of trying to harness uh, human power. So I abstracted it, and that became the artwork for something that I just wanted to feel like it kept going on and on, and that became this series called Jump. And what I love about this topic of migrations is that just when you think it's over, it just pops up again. And now, thanks to Donald Trump, it's like spiking again, so it just keeps ebbing and flowing and ebbing and flowing. And now that we look at what's happening in Europe as well. So this piece has been shown um, in other countries to sort of symbolize and reflect on their migration issues as well. So I'm just gonna go through those a little quickly. You could see some of the textures. So for me, my language is textiles. It's yarn, it's pattern. 
And that's why I choose to work with uh, fiber. So thinking back to the story of migration, um, that's been a constant as well. My father was a migrant worker until he was 13. Or, yes, he started at 13 when his father died. That's how the family had to support themselves. All the kids then had to start working in, in the fields. So this was kind of an homage to my family in terms of um, the paths that people have to take and all sort of like the symbology of it. I like the language of textiles. I like to take something that is already a textile and sort of show it in a different way. So in this case, where the houndstooth is, is a digital print representation of a scanned houndstooth, which is then embroidered with the houndstooth pattern. So I really like to mix up these high and low uh, processes. I like to sort of create a texture where there may not be any. And it, uh, the piece was called Farm Workers Jacket. Now, the funny thing is, I, I've just noticed this trend where I, I introduce a small idea and then it just keeps growing. It just sort of keeps going. This started off as a very small piece, then suddenly it became a, a large wall piece. But this one small idea of the um, flag morphed into my project Future Flags of America which is the California pieces um, on display at the Maloof right now. This is study for the 2050 US flag and study for the 2035 California flag. And I based it on uh, research of census information as to when the tipping point of majority minorities will change. And for me, I wanted to explore this idea of um, where change may come from, but I also wanted to sort of do the kind of research. I don't think the proportions of the flag will change. I don't think a lot of the things of the flag will change. It'll just probably morph, was my hypothesis. So I did a lot of research about regulations for the flag, how it should be hung, but then I started to swap out some of the things that are in it. Uh, there's applique, screen print, um, embroidery. I wanted to get this feeling of where would the next flag come from? Just like Betsy Ross created the flag, mm -hmm. perhaps your neighbor is going to create the next US flag from whatever is around. So I, I got materials from Michaels and Beverly's. These are supply stores. I did some printing online. So these were all sort of things that every man could do. So again, a mixture of high-low. There's crochet, hand crochet tassels at the bottom. And then for the American flag, I remember seeing rebosos and sarapes with fringe that was knotted with language. And I can't find it. I might have made this up mm -hmm. and just remembering it incorrectly. But I know that there's something like that out there. I know there's decorative fringe, so that's really what was uh, compelling me. I swear I've seen letters knotted. Uh, so that's where I started to bring in hand knotting into this as well. So it's hand knotting, digital print, hand embroidery, going back and forth. This says siempre cambio, which is um, always change or change always. Uh, you can imagine it as a phrase that like my grandmother would say when somebody was saying, oh, it's too bad that that road is, is uh, getting wider. It's too bad that this is happening. And it's sort of like siempre cambio, you know, there's always change. But I also wanted it to, to feel a little Latin, like a motto, like, like a directive to always change. So again, the piece grew to the point where it became a large um, 
billboard mural in the Mission District. I wanted the, uh, this is with Galleria de la, de la Raza there in Mission, but they had never really done this mixed media billboard before, and I wanted it to feel like a large version of that first flag. So it's a combination of digital print on paper with some uh, handmade elements. So this got me back to the handloom. And the fringe was actually woven on a handloom. And it's rope, again, scaling up these ideas. And then it was hand knotted. I, I did some of it too, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> then it was bundled up in my studio, and then it met the digital portion in the gallery. I wanted it to have the feel of looking like a textile, so I overlaid it with a twill pattern, and that was the finished piece. So it went from a small sort of like two inch by one and a half inch idea to something that became uh, 22 feet by 12 feet. And now I'd like to have it hang the other way from a building. So if anybody knows somebody who wants to be in a mural project, I I'm really would like to do that. So that, How does the material hold up? It held up pretty well, except for the mural itself. <laughs> so this is a problem that is happening in, in the mission, uh, is tagging. And what happened was there was a first tag, and then they asked me to cover it up, basically repair it. And I did that once, and it just felt wrong to me. I just felt like we weren't addressing the issue. I wanted to know why they were tagging a piece of art. I wanted to know why they were tagging this one. We, you don't, we don't know if it was a compliment, like they wanted to be part of this or they wanted to deface it. Everyone really loved the mural, so we don't think it offended anybody, but we never got to that point of finding out so the next time it happened, and you have to do something to murals that are tagged in San Francisco as a property owner, or else you get fined right away. You have to respond within uh, 48 hours, 72 hours. You can't leave something tagged. So what I did was I then started to just expand my field of stars whenever the tagging occurred. So the piece just sort of grew over time. Uh, it was kind of a call and response situation. And uh, so I spray paint stenciled over theirs, and then it sort of became layered. Like he didn't know whether the tagging came first or the stars did. Who, you know, you couldn't really tell. Then I added vinyl letters uh, to the top that kind of reference this idea of ownership. This land is your land, this land is my land. And uh, so it went on for a while, and every, you know, it was good because we were responding to it, and they, there was no legal action against the owner. But it went on for about three months. The piece was up for, for three months. And um, so this was my other idea, um, which they didn't <laughs> want to do. <laughs> Which, so I wonder how this might have uh, been. This, is the <laughs> but this is kind of a theme now where I'm learning to give collaborators a choice. You, you need In to this, sell that poster. Yeah. I still want to do that project. I think they might be okay with it now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I did a passport project and with the city of San Francisco. And they didn't like this idea either. They wanted it, they want to have a dialogue, but they don't want to offend anybody. They want it to be positive. I'm always told we want to be positive. And I just think that that's false. It's not what's happening. The fact is, it's a um, neighborhood in transition. There's lots of friction, and there are 
different factions. I feel like I'm just documenting what has happened. All right, I'm just going to few minutes. So these were all the different versions of this passport, again, with the flag theme. Uh, so I worked with um, Galleria on a solo show where they wanted me to sort of take a look at the neighborhood. And I decided to do a day in the life, and I stopped people on the neighborhood. I wanted to make sure that they lived within a certain radius of the gallery. Then I asked them questions like, how long have you lived here? And I got answers from two months to three generations. And it was this chance to do a show about, that's out of order, um, about the people that you see every day who's passing you, you know, to give pause for you. These were all life size, so the people were to scale. If they were five foot, they were shown as five foot. If they were six foot, they were shown as six foot. So it was, you were able to be in a room with all of your neighbors, but frozen in time, as opposed to passing them by every day. I changed the context a little bit to sort of uh, speak to the mission's history. Uh, she just happened to have a cape on that day, and I was so happy. Uh, her name is uh, Patricia. And they didn't, they gave me free reign. She didn't know she was going to be shown as the virgin. Um, <laughs> but I, it just sort of all kind of worked. I started to use a industrial jacquard type of tapestry. It's uh, much faster to produce in, uh, in terms of a budget. It's much more budget friendly. So the pieces were a mix of industrial jacquard tapestry and uh, printed on cloth, digital print. They all have a sarape as sort of a thematic um, name so that everybody could sort of see that, that that's the language of the mission. There's Maria in the back. She's so awesome. She's right there. She was sassy. <laughs> So this uh, brings us to a project that I'm installing next week at the Bart Plaza. And um, this is sort of taking off of the Lucha Libre, but I also wanted it to be documentary. These are things I've either been told, overheard, or read about this dialogue of the mission changing. So some of them are more positive, although I find them to be um, irritating at the same time. Uh, exotic is one of my least favorite words when describing something. Uh, but you know, people feel like it's hip, it's creative, it's different, it's edgy. That's why they want to live there. But there's also the displacement of what's happening with people. These are residents. This is Sarah. She is a nanny. Jesse is an artist. And they all have just different types of collisions and tensions listed that are happening. Um, so this was all going great until they saw Mickey. And this is being done in conjunction with Muni and Bart. And this is why I couldn't leave right away. I had to start having meetings about them basically censoring this piece. They don't want, they're trying to ask me to come up with solutions and I'm telling them I will not because I've done the piece. It's documentary. Mm -hmm. This is what Mickey told me in telling me a story about her confrontation with somebody who was a newcomer to the area. Um, so my feeling is, you know, you have to just sort of deliver what you believe and, and the viewer will decide, or BART officials will decide. So I don't know what they're going to do, but I told them that that I'm just delivering the pieces and they can decide from there. And I will, if they don't show it, I will show it other places. If they censor it, I'll, I told them to make sure that it's clear that they are censoring it and that I'm not providing a censored piece. Uh, this may not make it either. You're not supposed to have references to either tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. So <laughs> the tequila versus makers of art. No one said anything about that yet, so we'll see what happens. But I, I, again, this idea of um, 
the culture that I've been exposed to is now sort of my everyday language. So I'll finish up uh, just a few minutes over. I'm going back to the rope now. And this is that piece that was on there. It came out, people were really respectful of this. This didn't get tagged. This that was on harm. The only remnants were, you know, from friendly reminders from dogs and <laughs> dirt. Um, but no one bothered it. But I really like this idea of hand nodding and language. And so I'm going to take that into my next series of pieces. And I just wanted to share a few trials, just some of the process that, that happens. Lots of trials in terms of almost figuring out resolution of font. And I'm really pushing the border now. The border has a lot more to say. The header work that is part of the material. A lot of it is recycled or reused material. A lot of it is uh, kind of um, man-made materials. And these will all have some language uh, that I'm still haven't really decided what's going to say what yet. But some of it will not be polite. <laughs> and that's Veronica, who's about to work on a piece that's all black. I want to make sure to show who I'm working with because I don't produce all this work myself. It's just too hard. So that, that is it. And I'm only like, <clears throat> so my, I don't think I have that, quite, that many slides, so I might go a little quicker. Um, but um, I'm basically just going to give a little bit of a run through of my process of evolving from doing decorative craft like sculpt, uh, pieces uh, into doing uh, more like sculptural type work. So, um, so when I graduated from college, uh, this is what I started doing. I started doing very decorative work, um, really kind of experimenting with technique. Technique was really a really important thing for me, um, honing down on just different things you can do with glass, color applications, different things like that. So, um, <clears throat> so I can't, actually, one of the, um, some of the pieces that I do, I come up with an idea to do something and then I try to somehow create it into, into the medium. So um, one, of the, one of the things that I was really interested in is kind of layering glass colors in this way. Um, there's currently an Italian technique called Encalmo where you connect two separate bubbles of glass and you create two different layers basically. Um, but you know, my, my idea was more that I wanted to create multiple layers and as many as 20 or 30. So to create a different bubble for each one of those layers was really, you know, it can take like five or six hours. So I came up with a technique to be able to do that in a different way where I would pre-make some um, cylinders of color and then I would cut those and slice them into little rings basically. And then I would grind each side of, the, of that ring. They would all be the same thicknesses. So then I would have different colors of different rings, stack them up, fuse them, melt them down, and then that's how I get this kind of um, technique, which something that I developed. Um, later I found out that there was another guy doing a similar thing in Seattle, and uh, I was taking a class at Pilchuk, and um, I, saw, I saw him do a demo, and I'm like, are you doing that with rings, you know? And then he goes, yeah, and he goes, is your name Jaime? And I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, you're the guy. And he goes, no, you're the guy. So anyways, so it was, the glass world is a very small community. So when somebody's doing something different, it kind of stands out and you kind of know who that person is and somehow we all meet at some point. Um, so, so anyways, this is from that technique. And then this is a, also an Italian technique called cane, where you pull a string of color really long, chop it up into little pieces, and then... You, you get these little lines that you can do different things with. Um, so I was experimenting with form, once again, doing craft. These are really highly technical pieces. Um, they're pretty big, too. They're some, like this piece is probably about 
for glass, that's pretty big. Um, so just kind of pushing the envelope on on how big I can get with these different techniques. And um, here you can really see the band of color and how that ring, once you spin it out into a plate, what it can become. Uh, but it's a continuous ring and they're kind of stacked up. And then I do, aside from the rings, do a traditional Italian technique. So the top and the bottom are actual bubbles that come together. Um, and then kind of playing around with color in a slightly different way. So I was experimenting with this uh, in San Francisco and I was selling these pieces at a, a department store, Gumps in San Francisco, which they were doing really well. And um, so here's another one. So um, during this time, I, you know, I saw an evolution to my, to my work where I really wanted to say something with glass. Like I, I really wanted to have more meaning in the work and have more narrative and just have the pieces be symbolic of something and meaningful um, to just, you know, personal experiences or, or just to create some kind of narrative. So I started to, to make little homies out of glass. <laughs> And these guys are about maybe that big. And, um, you know, growing up in, in, in East LA, um, you know, just something that you, well, especially when I was growing up, now it's a little bit kind of cleaned up a little bit more, but, but you know, it, it wasn't uncommon to see a shooting or to see a fight, you know, like every week there would be gang members battling or, you know, throwing down and, and so, you know, I. It's, it's a unique thing to see in glass because you're, you know, figurative work is not something you see often. Um, but to see like a homie with a gun is like, you know, it's definitely, you don't definitely see that in glass. So I started kind of playing around with that and um, the whole kind of gang, uh, talking a little about, about gangs and, and drinking and um, some, of the, some of the things that, you know, people dealing with where I grew up. Uh, it's, it's, it's cheaper to buy a beer. When I grew up, it was cheaper to buy a 40 ounce beer than it was to like get a meal. So, uh, or, you know, buy something to eat. So, so it was like a dollar for, for, a, for a 40. So, you know, people would hang out and, and, and get drunk. And there was uh, liquor stores are ubiquitous in, in, in East LA or Boyle Heights or um, all these uh, different communities. Um, tattoos, body art. So, you know, it was inter I started to kind of really look at creating posture to, through glass, creating some kind of um, um, idiosyncrasies and, you know, just, just things that are, that are cultural or recognizable to, to a, a, a Chicano guy walking around in East LA. You know, what does that look like? How do, how do, how do they hold themselves? How do they walk? You know, um, how is that representative of, of, of what I'm, you know, the, the the people I'm trying to speak of. Um, so, um, Mexican wrestling. Mexican wrestling is like a big thing for for the Latino culture uh, or Chicano culture. So, um, I actually watched this documentary of you know heroes and and um, it was a, a um, Mexican wrestling documentary documenting like these uh, TJ Mexican wrestlers. And you know, there's always like the villain, the hero, and they, they then they have midgets, and then they have the gay <laughs> Mexican wrestlers. So there's like these different like little literally categories of of the people that that, that are in Mexican wrestling. And um, I thought it was a interesting thing to kind of play around with the idea of of you know heroes and and uh, the images they create for themselves and. Um, so I kind of created a whole body of, of just made up Mexican wrestlers. Um, a lot of these have, once again, playing around a little bit with technique, with different color, experimenting with color applications. Um, all of these are pretty much color applications that I created. Um, so it was kind of an interesting challenge. Um, uh, playing around with figurative taking it a little bit more into the sculptural realm, uh, playing around with form, also looking at like uh, contemporary Mexican masks. So um, I had some collectors that um, really liked some of the work that I was doing around masks. So it really kind of pushed me to 
investigate um, masks and um, where they come from and um, the evolution of masks in, in Mexico and, and uh, uh, different things going on with that. So just, uh, I think I did a installation of for Dia de los Muertos, I created um, a whole pile of glass skulls. Um, so I was doing, I was experimenting with that. So this is, this is from that, from that piece. Here's one of the masks that those collectors were, were looking at. So a lot of this is like Mesoamerican inspired work. Not going into that. That was like kind of the next level uh, of of my my process, um, and I was really researching. I felt that if I started to replicate sculptures that are Mesoamerican or from Mexico, that I would kind of discover certain um, narratives or certain lifestyles or certain worldviews of, of those cultures from the past that, you know, that I come from. So, so I started to kind of really, by, by creating, it was almost like an archeological process of discovery. So that was an Omic head one of the biggest uh, um, uh, empires of, of Mesoamerica, or one of the first. Um, and here's a, a birth goddess. Uh, actually, Armando uh, owns that piece. He's a collector sitting in the back. So once again, just kind of replicating uh, idolos and different uh, sculptures from, from Mesoamerican, but also experimenting once again, like honing down on technique and really acquiring some, some of these skills. Um, uh, I actually studied with an Italian master from Murano. Uh, he's actually one of, the, one of the best sculptors in the world. And if you're familiar with the glass world, anybody that does this kind of work has either learned from him directly or indirectly, but it all kind of stems down from, from this one guy. Um, so I was lucky and fortunate enough to, to work with him on several occasions. So, um, so then my work started kind of getting into the next stage of, of sculpture. Um, and I guess it could, could be considered fine art to some degree. So um, I started making work that um, is a little bit more about a story or a narrative or, or something that speaks a little bit more about something, something meaningful. So I started making, I made a, a series of cucarachas, um, and that, they're about this big, um, and I was doing installations of these guys, and you know, it was important for them to be realistic because I really wanted to have that impact of, you know, that icky feeling, that, that kind of grotesque, like, oh, I can't even look, you know? Um, and you know, it was an intuitive thing to, to make these guys, but then I started realizing that Everybody has a cockroach story. Like people started telling me at, at this exhibition, like all their stories about cockroaches and how they had this one experience. And it was really weird how it was kind of playing on nostalgia and connecting to people on this nostalgic level. That um, that you know that that it was just kind of like they started telling me all their stories and their narratives, and and it was a way to kind of connect to an audience that was on another level. Um, for me personally, they speak about uh, marginalized communities. Um, people that live in poverty especially have to deal with you know, cockroaches and rodents and certain, certain things that, that um, can create uh, uh, just kind of like this, this, this impact on your psyche um, that can be long term. So this, this, uh, these uh, pieces also among them was one of these guys as well. Um, showing all your pieces today. Um, so these, uh, this piece speaks about, uh, once again, mar marginalized communities. Uh, the Cucarachas were also part of this ex exhibition. Um, so, you know, talking about the prison industrial complex, um, how the U.S. basically is, uh, has the most people in prison in the world by far. Um, nobody even comes close. And, um, and we're only like, you know, um, compared to other countries, our population is fairly small in, in, um, in relationship to, to the people that we have in prison. So this, this piece is, you know, 
the, the second that you're asked, put your hands behind your back. So it's, it's the minute before they put the handcuffs on your wrist. Um, so the, the glass is kind of very ethereal, very light, very kind of passive. But then the shadow is also part of the piece where the shadow represents kind of like the anger, the frustration, the, the, um, that whole other uh, alter ego that exists that, you know, um, um, that people must, must feel when, when, they're, when they get singled out. Um, a lot of the, the, the people that are in prison happen to be people of color. So obviously there's, there's a problem that we're having even currently where you know, African-American kids and Latinos are being shot um, um, accidentally or, you know, just happens that um, it's, 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 it's been going on and it's something that is, is, a, is a big problem. Um, so this speaks a little bit about, about that. Um, another piece, well, I, I was, this is a piece that was uh, for a glass exhibition at the Oakland Museum. Um, actually, it was the 50th anniversary of Glass, which was a couple of years back. And um, it's called Charros y sus Caballos. And the idea was to invite a kind of disenfranchised community to come to a museum dressed up as a charro. So, um, you know, Mexican, Mexican folks or people from Mexico uh, rarely come to a museum. You know, they. they they, they can't relate to the R, or maybe it's just something that, that is just not for them. Uh, my parents don't understand, you know, certain things that they see in museums, especially. So I created this piece to kind of pay homage to, to the Mexican traditions. And my dad, um, I happen to actually, it's also based on a memory. Um, my, my, uh, my mom's uh, brother happened to be the champion charro of her town. Um, uh, uh, during a time when I went to visit Mexico when I was six years old. Then I went to, to my dad's um, hometown and his brother happened to be the champion charro of his town. So I have this memory of being six, six or seven years old and going to, uh, to Mexico for the first time and seeing my, my uncles going to a charreada, which is a Mexican um, rodeo, and um, seeing my, uh, my uncle's uh, horse completely adorned with flowers. And the way they, they, in the small towns, the way they award for a trick or points, uh, the way they, they, they distinguish how many points somebody should get is they put a flower on your horse. So, um, so the fact that my uncle's horse had like tons of flowers, you know, more than every, anybody else's was the fact that he, get, he got the most points. So I had that memory that kind of stuck in my mind and I decided to make a piece that, that, that took, put attention to that memory. Um, but it was also inviting people to come into the museum dressed up as a, as a charro. I don't have a picture of it, but I actually came to this exhibition dressed up as a charro. <laughs> Oops. So this, uh, um, stepping it up uh, size-wise, um, I started to kind of do life-size figures in glass. And they're all hand-blown. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really work with molds or anything like that. So um, it's something that I haven't seen in the glass world. There, there may be something, someone somewhere doing life size figures in glass, but, but it's something that I haven't seen and, and I really <coughs> wanted to challenge myself to really kind of push the envelope in that sense. Um, so this, this, this is a little girl. Um, she's about four feet tall and she's holding a little hummingbird. Um, this exhibition was, um, at the Snack Museum in, in Indiana, uh, Notre, at, at Notre Dame University. Um, I had a solo exhibition there. This was kind of like the centerpiece. For them. <clears throat> the show is called Torpor, and um, Torpor is um, the hi hibernation for a hummingbird. So a uh, hummingbird can go into hibernation at any given moment if it's too cold outside or if it hasn't had enough to eat. So it's a, it's a mechanism for survival. Um, which was pretty much kind of like the pre uh, premises for, for the show that I was uh, having. Um, so this was kind of a centerpiece when you walked into, into the exhibition, you see this little girl holding a, a hummingbird that's in Torpor. Um, and that was also the name of the, of the exhibition. 
This is uh, some of the other pieces that I had there. You can see um, how tall she is there. Um, I had a bunch of Mesoamerican sculptures laid out on, on top of glass. Um, speaking a little bit about my whole process of archaeology and that whole idea of, of researching um, my ancestry through a process. Um, and process has always been like really important to me, technique and process and, and acquiring these skills, acquiring this technique. Um, it's something that, that you know, um, especially in glass, I'm sure in any, in any art form, um, technique can be something that can be very difficult to attain. Um, glass especially takes particularly a long time to really get good at, at uh, but I'm sure that's true for everything. But, but um, so, so my process here of, of, of you know, that, that whole approach of researching through, through uh, creating, um, and also broken glass is kind of you melt glass and in, in to create glass. So um, that's, we also melt silica, but, but uh, in today's modern time, you actually can melt already made broken glass to create more glass. So, um, so that was one of the installations. Um, I also did another take on the Encercelados, uh, where I put uh, uh, decorations of um, kind of um, William Morris inspired decorations, talking about the, the American craft movement. Um, and, uh, you know, but also going back to the the prison industrial complex, the, the being arrested kind of pose, and this woman is, you know, uh, illustrating that. There's a detail. And then here's uh, those pieces then put on pedestals. Some of the some of the pieces that I had left over from that show. Um, then you know, then now they take more of a kind of a museum uh, a presentation. Like, you know, uh, kind of mimicking the way they, they get displayed in, in a museum, maybe, in, you know, in today. But it, it's, it's the impact of seeing them on the floor on top of broken glass. It's a really huge contrast uh, to see them on a pedestal. This piece is actually, I had to make it three times to get it right, but it's pretty huge. It's maybe about, about that big. Um, when you're working with glass, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or have, have seen the process, but um, you work with a team of people. And um, to make something this size, I had a team of about six people working with me. Like, But then it's a pretty instant kind of uh, process where a piece like this can take three hours, which that's fairly short for for make a, making a piece from um, beginning to end. But in the glass world, three hours is like a ridiculous amount of time. Like, you know, you, you're gonna die after three hours. <laughs> um, so so uh, it's a team of about six people. Um, it's a studio in Richmond, California. Um, they have the biggest equipment that I know of in, in, in California. So um, the, you definitely need like a whole nother set of equipment to, to be able to produce something like this. Um, here is the next level of making life-size figurative work. Um, it's, all not, it's not all done in one piece, neither was a little girl. But just the shirt alone is maximizing the biggest equipment in California. So that shirt maximizes the glory hole that I use, um, which is you know, a glory hole you can literally walk into. Um, so it maximizes the width and then the pants maximizes the length. So it's like scratching the back of, of, the, of the equipment. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea, but this guy is pretty much this high. Um, and it's all hand sculpted. Um, <clears throat> I did a little bit of cold working to get a little bit more effect of the posture and um, the effect that I wanted. <clears throat> this piece is, is once again speaking, uh, actually specifically more about uh, the workers people that, that actually bring food to our table and how, um, you know, people get, people come from other countries to find a livelihood, to find uh, a place to be able to support their families, just to basically exist. And they migrate to the U.S. 
and they, they do a lot of these, these, these jobs that nobody else wants, uh, working in the sun, excruciating conditions, um, and, and then you know, they get arrested because they don't, they're immigrants, they, they don't uh, belong here, or, or they're not allowed to be here, or it's illegal for them to be here. Um, so so this, this, on his hands it says, ni aquí, ni allá, neither here nor there. So he can't survive in his own country and he can't survive here. Um, so he's being uh, criminalized uh, and he's just a simple, you know, honest uh, working man. Um, so the, there's a faint farm workers union um, shirt just to kind of represent that, that he is a, a worker. Um, and, you know, just to go a little bit further, um, a lot of these people that migrate to the U.S., um, um, the U.S. has had impact in those countries or, or direct um, impact that creates certain situations where these people can no longer make a livelihood there. Um, their, their, um, their certain involvement, U.S. involvement, that uh, direct involvement with people coming from these specific countries that, that uh, you know, that make certain conditions that make it pretty much unlivable to some degree. So, um, so anyways, um, this is the last series of pieces that, I, that, I, that, I've been, that I've been working on or that I actually worked on. <clears throat> kind of, the way I work is I, I get an idea to do stuff or to do something, then I kind of move on to something new and different. So um, I did a whole series of these guys. They're life-size deer. Um, and it also was talking about going back to a memory I had once again when I was growing up. Um, I was taken hunting for the first time when I was maybe seven years old. And um, I was given a gun. It was the first time I shot a rifle. And my, you know, we, got, we got separated from my uncle and some of my cousins and those two groups. And we saw a stag and I was, my cousin couldn't see the stag. It was among you know, a group and um, he gave me the rifle to shoot it. So I, you know, I aimed and I was about to shoot it and I just couldn't pull the trigger. I couldn't do it, it didn't, it, it seemed alien to me to shoot an animal for no reason, you know. For me it was for no reason. Uh, I mean, my uncles, they, 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 they kill the animal and they'll eat the, the meat throughout the whole year. But um, it's something that I, I didn't feel a relationship to and it just didn't feel like I needed that to kill this animal to survive. So, um, so I couldn't do it, but it just left an impression in, in my mind, and it was uh, uh, something I was reflecting back on. Um, and um, <clears throat> so, so to me, it, it was speaking about you know uh, different cultures that 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 hunt to, to survive, uh, but but how it's kind of become uh, uh, more of a sport in Western societies and more to show off a trophy on a wall. Um, and not necessarily in all um, uh, uh, aspects, you know, um, is it to, to survive. So, you know, the, it, it, it started thinking about it a little bit more and it's just questioning the whole idea of, of how men are socialized in this way, how men are usually the ones that are having to, you know, go through this rite of passage to, through this very violent act. And it's, you know, it's just kind of an interesting th thing for me to look back and, and, and just kind of see that a lot of cultures go through this process of, of, of rite of passage through, this, through a violent act. So it makes me kind of think of like why men are so violent, why men are particularly more violent than women, um, you know, and, and, and certain uh, men's kind of need to control or be uh, power, have power over nature. So um, that's kind of what this, what this series is a little bit about. So I created a whole trophy room, um, about five or six pieces. Um, I had a couple of shows. One of them was uh, recently in, in a place in the Bay Area. Um, aside from, from the stags, I had um, a couple of installations of, of hanging antlers that to me was speaking more about um, indigenous cultures and what they may use uh, an antler for something that they that they have a spiritual connection to. Um, in the Latino culture, there's a lot of um, you know our ancestry has a lot of relationships to to el venado. It, it, there's a lot of rituals around the dance of the uh, of el venado and and uh, the payote and all these different 
um, kind of relationships that, that certain indigenous cultures can have. Um, to some degree, they were used by shamans for medicinal purposes as well. So I, I was trying to create an installation that spoke a little bit more of, of uh, you know, another kind of what it could have been at some point in, in, in past cultures. And here's another angle of that. Um, and here's another a different installation. <clears throat> so now, um, uh, some of the work that I've been doing as far as, you know, I, I see, so it was important for me to show kind of an evolution of, you know, when I started doing it, when I was doing craft and uh, more decorative type work, and then slowly progressing into these more uh, fine art sculptures. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit of a direction that I'm kind of, you know, seeing evolve even more. Um, I'm currently working on life-size little kids uh, to speak about immigration, um, uh, where little kids are being arrested or being handcuffed or being, you know, or they're holding a little teddy bear or something. Um, uh, so a lot of these kids that are migrating from Central and South America um, are also being imprisoned. They're being put in detention centers. And, and in a lot of ways, they actually qualify for, for refugee status. Um, so, but, you know, when they get thrown into these, uh, you know, these camps in the middle of nowhere, it's really hard to get representation. So there's a lot of stuff going on there that a lot of people don't know about. And I kind of want to bring a little bit of attention to that in some of my work um, to create a, a conversation. Another thing that I do um, aside from doing these sculptures and, and doing uh, glass uh, art, is um, the glass world is a very, um, it's not a very diverse place. Um, um, so one of the things that I, that I started is I started a program where I teach underserved youth uh, the art of glass blowing. And it's something that's pretty much unheard of uh, to have for a little kid. I mean, I definitely had, I didn't see glass till I was like in college, literally. So um, for, for a 12 year old kid, you know, living in Watts or East LA or something, to have access to be able to work with this medium, which is very expensive, um, is, is, is a pretty unique thing. So, um, so I started this program four years ago in affiliation with a, a place in uh, Watts called uh, Watts Labor Community Action Committee. They had a glass point studio, they never turned it on, and they um, haven't, hadn't found somebody to run the program. And it, uh, it was kind of serendipitous because at the same time in the Bay Area, I was trying to create a program like that, and I wasn't having any luck with uh, the nonprofits that existed up in the Bay Area. So when I came to LA, um, I um, discovered, was introduced to this program, and uh, started a pro that program, and um, it was, it was on for about three years, and then they ran out. They ran out of money. So once again, so now I'm in the process of creating my own pro program, and I, I don't have a nonprofit status. I'm just doing my own thing and winging it. So I did a Kickstarter. Um, these are some of my students from Watts. Um, another thing that that I um, was doing was um, the bigger glass community started to kind of pay attention to this necessity to cre create more diversity in glass. So they started inviting my students to, to be part of glass conferences. So this was a glass conference that happened at the Crucible in Oakland. And, uh, and my, my, my students were given awards. I don't, I don't, I don't remember what, what the award was for, but, um, but anyways, um, here are kids from Watts in, in, in Oakland. Um, and then this is kind of, um, my Kickstarter. So if any of you guys want to donate to this Kickstarter, it's actually still going on till Monday. And the Kickstarter is basically to buy equipment to, um, to uh, have a little glass point studio where I can give free glass point classes to local kids in, in Boyle Heights area. Um, I'm donating my time 100%. Um, and when it gets to the point where I run out of the Kickstarter <coughs> money, I'm just going to subsidize it myself. Um, so, um, so anyways, yeah, that's, that's what's going on. And right now, a couple of those kids are enrolling to Santa Monica Community College to continue glass blowing. So I'm really happy to say that. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay.